Well, let's talk a little bit about hardware. Our next presentation is probably a, um, a very interesting pro uh, presentation by uh, Axon. Axon is also a very innovative uh, startup um, that I'm working with. Um, and Philip Axa is uh, giving a speech. Felix, uh, Philip Axa uh, joined us recently to Axon and he's leading system architecture uh, to shape uh, tomorrow's in-vehicle communication. Philip is an accomplished uh, professional with more than eight years of experience in automotive industry, specifically in the field of automotive Ethernet and switches and FIs. He is an um, active participant in various Open Alliance technical committees and uh, is shaping um, all the industry landscape uh, and driving innovation in the automotive connectivity area. Philip, floor is yours. Thank you for the kind introduction. Um, so the best thing about this talk is that this is the last thing between you and lunch. Um, so let's get started. Um, so um, this is about realizing uh, asymmetric data rates with energy efficient ethernet. So what is this all about? Um, so, agenda-wise, we, we have a brief, brief look at what energy efficiency is and what the motivation behind all this stuff is. Then I will give a bit of introduction, overview about timing and latency, um, what the implication of energy efficient Ethernet is to the system, a partitioning, I mean, where specific actions and, and things are residing. Um, then we look at configuration, uh, power, and a bit of robustness topics. Um, and then I summarize the talk. So, introduction. What is this all about? So, in, in um, the enterprise data center kind of domain, um, at least to a big degree, I'm not saying always, uh, traffic is um, usually dynamic and you don't know upfront exactly what to expect. So, um, it makes sense to, to use symmetric uh, data rates um, because customers potentially use the same kind of rates in all directions and you need to accommodate for this. And this is also um, what we currently have in the car with the T1 technologies, everything is essentially symmetric. Um, the thing with automotive is that if we look at the applications that we have, at least um, in, in the zone with uh, some things like cameras and radars and so on, is that um, there is an obvious uh, source sync relation. So data is produced at one spot and then it's funneled through some fusion, uh, towards some fusion aggregation and, and um, uh, in the opposite direction, uh, there is essentially only control information, steering information, uh, like for instance, action things for TCP IP or some control I squared C uh, things to control these sensors. Um, so, is that a problem? Um, the, it works in terms of functionally you can address this, um, but it, it comes with a bit of a disadvantage, I would say. So the current T1, um, as already mentioned, is a, a full duplex symmetric scenario, um, except for 10 base T1S, which uh, we mentally exclude here. Um, and uh, all the speeds ab above, including 100 megabit, are active idle. That means that even though if you don't really transmit any data, it does um, still do something uh, in order to keep time sync and exchanges essentially um, uh, scrambler patterns and so on to keep PLA lock locked. Um, so the, the power consumption of FIs, uh, specifically T1 FIs, is uh, mostly data independent and underutilized links still um, consume power, because even though if you don't send any frames, it still does stuff. Um, the energy efficient, energy efficient Ethernet, so clause 78, addresses this. So um, before going into specifically how it works and what it does, this isn't something specific to T1 automotive or so. That has been around in, I think, 802, what is it, 3AZ or so from 97-ish. Um, so it's, it's something which has been there. Um, and this technology, I mean, energy efficient Ethernet, is standardized and also included in, in the T1 technology from 1 gig up to now 25 gig, essentially. So it, it supports this. 
Um, let's look at um, a specific uh, application scenario and, and how, how an energy efficiency that works in a dashboard kind of overview. So let's assume we have some image scenario with the video um, and, and um, out of interest, I I've, I've say I've supplied with Poodle because that was what, how it usually looks like, uh, also what you see in the demos. Um, and then there is some Ethernet to CSI conversion thing going on uh, and um, over, over Ethernet, so let's say 1722, um, you send then, or the, the, the ECU sends control frames uh, um, to, to control the imager, usually I, I squared C. Uh, let's assume just for the uh, exercise that's 400 kilohertz, uh, 60 frames per second for um, uh, K um, raw video. Um, so the way what, what happens really if you start stuff up, then um, uh, what, you, what you want is that the training happens, it takes roughly 100 milliseconds, uh, um, in reality uh, less. Uh, then there is a bit of uh, initialization happening where this, this ECU thing is then pushing a lot of configuration stuff over uh, in form of I squared C messages over something like 1722. And then stuff is running. And the imager is then sending data back towards the fusion or something like this. Um, uh, and every now and then uh, to control something like brightness or shutter speed or some, some, some sensor um, actuation mechanics going on, the ECU sends then control frames back. Um, this is then these blue um, um, packets here. But besides this, this link is doing really nothing. And um, um, LP, uh, energy efficient ethernet offers the opportunity of then shutting down this active idle transmission and, and thus saving power. That's roughly what it does. Um, so um, you get the best of both worlds in a way that if you wanted to, you, you have the fast imager in a timing where you can pump data through and once it's running, you, you just use what you need essentially. Um, but, but now this is super high level at the moment, so it, it, I'm saying it does LPI or energy efficient ethernet and then it saves power, but how does it work in more detail like protocol wise? Um, so energy efficient ethernet um, uh, consists essentially of two different portions. First, the, the PHY, so the PCS and PMA part need to implement um, the uh, relevant uh, portions, but somebody needs to decide exactly when um, the link should go into this LPI mode. And this is this low power uh, um, client, uh, LPI client, which decides when specifically the link shall enter LPI and also when it shall leave LPI. Uh, this LPI thing is asymmetric. That means that um, um, the directions can be, are, are independent and TX can be in LPI while RX is still transmitting and the other way around, but they are, can also be simultaneously in API. Um, so the T1s, uh, like gigabit and, and 100 megabit and so on and so forth, um, um, require timing locks. So they need to be synchronized in a way and PLLs and, and, and the entire DSP need to be essentially locked in order to still allow sampling. Um, and the way how this is achieved is that um, during this quiet time when the link is, is sleeping, um, every now and then uh, s certain symbols are exchanged, um, called, which is called refresh, um, to allow that they are, or guarantee that they are still have an opportunity to remain in lock essentially. Um, at the time when the API clients decides, well, I, please retain, give me, give me the link back, I, I want to transmit information again. Um, the, uh, the phi will then essentially transmit an alert, uh, and after this alert, it will transmit a wake, um, and then uh, after some time, the link is available again for friend transmission. So now that we have seen roughly how it works, um, let's dive a bit deeper into timing, um, specifically how long these, these uh, things like wake up uh, and, and uh, so on take and what the implication on system level is. So um, now that this is, is specific to CH, what I'm now showing. Um, the PCS is using Reed-Solomon coding. Um, so everything is transmitted into Reed-Solomon frames. 
And energy efficient Ethernet are the signaling and, and uh, command words, so to say. Every, every like events are synchronized um, to Reed Solomon frames. Um, it's 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 some loosely think of this like a, a TDMA kind of scheme, but it's 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 in reality it's not really. But it, it gives you um, a notion of of slots. Um, so. Um, um, the master and slave are, are also synchronized on this Reed Solomon frame counter, so they have an idea on, on what the time um, on the other side is. And that's used in order to disentangle and interleave um, these refresh um, um, uh, uh, commands, for instance, and make sure that, that both sides are not um, accidentally, um, um, both are refreshing or alerting at the same instant, so that there's like a collision scenario which would create additional noise and make everything a bit harder. So these alert and um, uh, refresh cycles are interleaved between master and slave and there are distinct points in time when something can happen. So um, when it, there are distinct points like this pseudo -TDMA, TDMA kind of thing which I mentioned that also implies that there are some um, latency penalties because not at any instant in time when the API client wants something, it can get that. It needs to wait until these, these alert points are essentially reached. So this is giving some um, illustration of what's happening and what like, the kind of scenario is. Um, uh, but before we go into, into this, let me, let me go a bit into numbers first. So there are two different flavors of, of um, energy efficient Ethernet. There's the standard EE, and then there's this sub-flavor which is called SLOWIC. SLOWIC is technically the same thing, with the only difference is that it allows um, wake-ups on, um, uh, on less occasions. So there are le less of these slots where you can say, I want to wake up again. The advantage of this is that you can have uh, the opportunity to have more power saving. Disadvantage is that everything well, happens potentially a bit slower because you need to wait longer to, for this event to occur. Um, and uh, the, the implication is that, I mean, these are numbers which you can also find in the spec, um, is that um, the, the latency until um, um, when the API client eventually wants to send uh, a frame is in the order of between six uh, microseconds uh, for the energy efficient Ethernet standards thing for 10 gig and uh, 25 microseconds for two and a half. And then for the slow wake, it's um, significantly higher because these, these alert points are scarce. Um, so the way how this works in reality is that now what I'm showing here in the, the top is the data which is residing inside the Mac and ready for transmission. So normally it looks like this. So the Mac has some frame or some data. It pumps out the frame over the XMRI 30s kind of interface and then it falls off, uh, out of the MDI um, and for transmission. Then the, the Mac doesn't have anything. The LPI client decides, oh, now let's better go to LPI. Then with the um, uh, LPI client sends over the MRI interface this magic LPI thing. And uh, the MDI will then go into, into this uh, API phase and eventually every now and then they, they send this, this refresh thing. Um, here I made a quick mistake that I realized before, <laughs> before this. Um, so this idle thing should actually coincide with this um, black line here. So at the time when the Mac uh, has, has data again and it wants to transmit, it can't really because the, the link hasn't woken up again. So it needs to go through this cycle of um, 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 alert and, and um, uh, wake up essentially. And this is then the time in the worst case scenario that I indicated here. That's essentially the time where the Mac needs to wait until the link is ready again and up. So the question is, is this a lot or is it acceptable? At the end of the day, I think this is something for the um, application to decide whether these timings or latencies are acceptable or not. I tried to put it a bit into its perspective just to uh, give a bit of like a, an idea in which like order of magnitude these things are. So here I, I'm only including um, the two and a half gig numbers because they are the largest ones of the family. 
and also at the moment um, automotive is more looking into two and a half gig um, uh, and I didn't include the other ones. So we have these 25 microseconds for the standard energy efficient ethernet and for the slow wick it's, it's larger, one, 38. Now just for comparison's sake, so this is 16.6 milliseconds for frame rate, so um, uh, significantly larger. Uh, uh, one frame transmission of um, the largest MTU is, is a two and a half gig, uh, 4.8, and a 64 uh, octet frame is, is uh, 0.2. So compared to a frame transmission, these wake-up latencies are significant. I mean, they are there, and it's, it's one order of magnitude larger, so to say, or even more for the, for the slow wake. Um, but if you look at the control information, so what's like traveling into the opposite direction, like an I2C frame, where the I2C actually needs to be unrolled on, on the actual I2C pins, an I2C transaction is in the order also of roughly 100 microseconds. So, and that means that the actual execution of this I2C read or write is four times as long as a latency where you need to wait until you get the, the link back, essentially. So compared to I2C transactions, this additional wait time is essentially nothing. Well, not, it's not nothing, but it's, 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 it's uh, one quarter, roughly, depending a bit what you're doing here. Um, so let's look a bit at this partitioning thing. I've mentioned this API client, and at the moment it's a bit vague where exactly everything is living. Um, so the 8023 view on, on, if you just blindly read the spec document, it, it looks like this. So you have this API client, which is uh, literally just a gray box in the document. Um, what this thing does, nobody knows. The, the spec says it sends out um, uh, API commands to this reconciliation layer, and then uh, that falls out over XMI. Um, and when the link shall go back out of API, then it sends idle again. That's the only thing which essentially the spec says. Um, the, the there is no linking to 8 to 1 queuing also. So there's no strict rule set how, how um, a switch, for instance, or some, some Mac with queues, at which point in time, what is like the qualifying property when this thing should go into LPI and what, so when it should go out again. So that means that a lot, lot of things are in reality completely left to the implemented silicon vendors to, to drive this and make it somewhat work. And, and, and um, um, everything what is using this API client, also other technologies, can't really rely exactly what what this thing does. Except we know it outputs API and outputs idle, but not when and how. Um, the implication of this is that um, if we look at SOCs out there, or switches or something, um, which is on the market and where you can, which you can buy today, um, there are essentially these three different options. So some don't implement energy efficient ethernet at all. They don't know about LPI. Um, so um, they will never enter and leave LP, um, energy efficient ethernet LPI mode. There's um, another um, option. Some devices implement what I say you know, is poor energy efficient ethernet, where uh, the decision when something shall go into LPI is extremely coarse-grained and some software or driver needs to write to a register, then everything goes into LPI, and the driver needs to like specifically actively deassert it and then it goes out. But it, these decisions are not really happening super fine-grained on a per-frame granularity, on a per-Q granularity, uh, and they are super slow because everything is software-driven. And some, well, I, I, some Macs implement good energy efficiency, that's what I think is good, um, so that everything is like linked to queues, 8.2.1 queues, so you can make it super fancy uh, with heuristics and, and um, somewhat anticipates what's going on and, and so on and so forth. But it, because nothing is set in stone, uh, in reality you can, if you're lucky you have this guy, if you're unlucky you have this guy. Um, so, as a silicon vendor or an also adopter, potential adopter who wants to use um, energy efficient Ethernet, in reality, really the only solution at, as of today is to use um, what I here called um, autonomous energy efficient Ethernet. I don't know whether there is a more accepted uh, uh, a term. And um, that means that a FI makes the decision when to go into LPI completely on its own without relying on any MAC intervention 
and this LPI code was going back and forth. Um, the way how this looks implementation-wise is that there is, because there are these latency constraints that we talked about earlier, um, uh, a FIFO in, in the device. And that needs to bridge the gap um, of this, what was it, 20-something um, um, microseconds uh, um, during which the Mac is potentially sending frames, but the link is still in LPI, uh, and we don't want to lose these frames. So they are then stored in this FIFO. Uh, so depending what kind of flavor you use and how fast your speeds are, this, like, this FIFO sizes are roughly in this, I mean, the worst case um, for, for the normal energy efficient ether, it's, it's 11 kb. For the slow one, it's, it's larger. For worst case kind of uh, dimensioning, I'm not saying it must be this size. Um, um, but specifically, like, this size seems to be a viable, viable solution for, for, for products. And, and um, by the way, this isn't something which we came up with, or I also, this is like something which has been around for ages. Uh, FIS for consumer grade or data center, which do energy efficient ethernet for thousand base T and so on, do this already for years. Um, so that's not new. Um, this autonomous energy efficient ethernet also comes with a bit of an implication, I would say. It's not really a drawback. Um, 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 the implication is that you can't use MAC uh, timestamping anymore. Because the, as soon as you have FIFOs in your device, and you have then FIFO always implies variable latency, because that's how FIFO works. Um, um, if the Mac is doing timestamping and saves PTP timestamps, they aren't potentially accurate enough anymore. So the solution, and this is also something which I think everybody has in the FIs as of today, is to have FI timestamping and just take the timestamps in the FI, and then the problem is gone. Or uh, another solution which uh, can be done, depending a bit how silicon vendors want to run this, is um, that uh, for the frames of interest, uh, a residence time is measured and you can then essentially like, correct the uh, delta or residual error and, and then have the correct timestamp again. So that the problem is relatively easy to solve. Um, let's look at power. So before showing the next slide, I'm not showing power numbers, and I'm also not showing relative power numbers. This is something, if you want to know a bit more, um, talk to me under NDA, and then I can tell you a bit what we are doing. I expect that you can also talk to other vendors, and then you will get a bit more information. Um, so the kind of configurations that you can use uh, in these kind of imaging or radar applications are essentially not fixed when it comes to master-slave relations. So any, because LPI goes in both directions, completely symmetrical, you can decide to, to have um, the um, uh, source as a master, for instance, and then the slave uh, towards the sink, um, which potentially is, is an interesting option because it buys you this synchronous ethernet kind of thing where you can like distribute uh, reference clock uh, easily. So this is something which for radar applications might be interesting. Um, power saving wise, um, it depends a bit in which direction you are going into LPI um, because the power hungry thing is RX because of DSP stuff. Um, so, well, naturally, that's somewhat obvious. If both directions are still data and, and are not LPI, then power consumption is highest. Um, uh, it goes down when uh, TX is going into LPI, and if RX goes into LPI, that's, it's, that gives you a bit more a power saving opportunity. And uh, the lowest is naturally when both are, are going into LPI, that was a bit, like, significantly goes down. Uh, but application-wise, probably not so interesting. Um, also, to be fair, I mean, it's not a perfect world. There are loose ends. Um, uh, Open Alliance is currently working on this, so there's Open TC16, um, which is trying to fill in these gaps. Um, uh, specifically, uh, TC16 is working now on this interoperability test uh, where certain vendors then can, similar to this other interoperability stuff, can plug their things together, there are these test cases defined, to figure out if stuff works. Um, so far, we didn't uh, discuss conformance testing in TC16, I also included this here, and also something EMI. So this is um, uh, something where traditionally companies like FTZ with Kerber and Bernd Kerber and so on would, would look into this, how, how the system behaves specifically under the influence of, of um, uh, RF, uh, external RF. Um, and also something I think which nobody really talked about so far 
is uh, what the heck is this API client actually doing and when, how is it linked to, to the 8021Q domain? Um, and this is something which eventually needs to be um, talked about because the performance of, of um, energy efficient Ethernet greatly depends how the decisions are made, when specifically the thing goes into LPI and when it comes back. If it's super coarse-grained and you need to write a register, then, well, yes, you can claim it's energy efficient Ethernet capable, but it doesn't really help a lot. Um, so I phrase this as a question at the moment um, to make it a bit more interesting and raise essentially discussion point. Um, so now uh, two remaining slides. Uh, just a bit of overview. This is specific again to 8223CH, so uh, two and a half, five, ten. Um, so the advantage um, of using 8023CH and energy efficient Ethernet, it's, it's essentially, given it's in this autonomous energy efficient Ethernet, it's some sort of plug and play thing. So you plug it into, into existing SOCs which happen to have some XFI or you use XGMI and, and it just works. Um, everything is Ethernet, so um, it's the same kind of technology, T1 technology, which we have already around for quite some time. So energy efficient Ethernet also hasn't specifically changed. It's the same energy efficient Ethernet. Naturally, the specific signaling on a physical layer is slightly different, but technology-wise, it's the same energy efficient Ethernet that has been around. Um, another interesting aspect is that the high data rate is potentially available when you need it for something like firmware updates or so, or also if, if some links w should be misused for diagnostic access, uh, you, it scales essentially. So it's not like hard frozen to something. Um, and it's a simple interoperability ecosystem. It's symmetric. Everything is essentially the same, um, except you need to test different vendors against each other. Uh, so, as a summary, the energy efficient Ethernet as a technology is available, and to I mean just browse around the the um, a booth and also for other conferences, you see energy efficient Ethernet on almost all of the um, multi gig um, um, slides uh, uh, around. So it, it's available. It's also scalable in terms of it will be also there for 25 gig and beyond. Actually, there's a G missing. Um, uh, comes with a certain latency um, penalty, which is the nature of how this works, but um, in my opinion, it's easily handleable with technology that we have, five time stamping and so on. Um, the API client can be, depending how exactly you put stuff together, can be in the Fi or the Mac. When it's in the Fi, it's this autonomous energy efficient Ethernet. If it's in the Mac, it will be more the way how IEEE thinks it should look like. And uh, it can potentially be linked to like queuing and 8021Q word. Um, but there's still a bit of open, open points um, uh, which need to be addressed in open uh, or also potentially 8021 or so uh, to, to um, nail down more behavior on, on this API client. So that concludes my talk and I will take questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Excellent. So I would like to make uh, one add-on. There is uh, currently a study group at IEEE where we exactly discuss about asymmetrical Ethernet. This is uh, one approach. So we um, will discuss uh, several approaches. We firstly are, are worried about describing the problem that we want to solve, the asymmetric links. What is the nature of the, the applications, the sensors? Um, and then we also will dig deeper into a, a definition of a project and then also look what is the best solution for it. So if you want to be part of this uh, um, very, very interesting topic, show up at dot three. Um, Steve is uh, welcoming everyone to join, <laughs> um, but only until the end of the year. Yes, that's right, <laughs> when I retire. Uh, thank you for this, very good. Uh, so as the guy who chaired the CH project and the CY project, 25 gig, um, CH, we actually um, made some enhancements to Triple E specifically to do these kinds of things. Triple E was really designed 
almost 20 years ago for data. It was just so you could signal up the stack that you had low, low utilization. It wasn't really specifically looking at the PHY itself in terms of power consumption. Uh, the changes we made in CH and then the changes we made in CY, which really kind of pushed that to the logical end, um, were so that you really could power up and power down the circuitry in the, in the link that wasn't busy um, and uh, be able to do that effectively. So this is, this is a very good way to do it. And as was pointed out, the LPI client's not defined. It's just a thing and it says, it, it's not our problem. You know, you do whatever you want to do with your client. So putting the client into the PHY and coming up with automatic mechanism, perfectly fine if you wanted to do something like that. I like the solution because I don't like the term asymmetric Ethernet because Ethernet, Ethernet has always been inherently asymmetric from a traffic standpoint. You know, there's nothing that says the traffic in each direction has to be the same. Um, so when we talk about asymmetric, we're really talking about asymmetric traffic. You know, it's asymmetric. The camera blasts stuff out like crazy, and then once in a blue moon, you talk to it the other way. That's the traffic. So here, you still get real Ethernet links available. And as you say, if you needed to suddenly go full, full speed in the other direction for a software update or something, you can do that. So I think this is a good approach to follow. Just, that's just me, my personal view. So thank you for this presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Cole, do you have a further question? Yeah. So this topic of um, just general asymmetric communications and specifically cameras uh, around SIRDES versus Ethernet is uh, in ASA as well. It's pretty interesting to see how it's going to um, how it's going to fall out. But but let's say that even you get a perfect um, uh, uh, perfect solution with energy efficient Ethernet for asymmetric communications. What other challenges? I, I question that there'll be other challenges. Uh, that aren't even related to the communication path. For example, cameras and anything related to camera and cam consumption of, ca of uh, image data is, uh, for example, around um, you know MIPI, uh, MIPI SEER or DeFi right now. And as far as I know, Ethernet, um, there's no like standardization for Ethernet files to, to, to have that, that interface. So could you comment sort of, either, either of you comment on, on those challenges? Colt, I, I do know more, but uh, um, I can't talk about that. Um, but I, uh, the, I can assure you MIPI Alliance is working on solutions. Um, I have a question. Do you expect uh, some uh, um, uh, influence on the AMI behavior using triple E. You mean inf well? Naturally, it's it's not coming for free, right? So uh, the question is just where how the behavior is at the moment and what the limits should be. So, um, uh, best of my knowledge, currently it's been looked into. There are experiments carried out, and and the performance is evaluated. Uh -huh. um, and then, I think the result will show how it performs at the end of the day. Um, as always, so what happens is you, you shut it off and then you have like these very tiny refresh cycles and if you like blast with RF on it, eventually it fails. It's just a matter of, mm -hmm. of when. I expect, I mean, I personally, uh, as a person, not Axon, I, I, I think it works. Um, uh, the limits and so on and the actual test scenario, this is something which we need to discuss, define and also discuss in TC16. Everything at the moment is completely no man's land and the wild west. But I think you, you don't require a new test specification for the EMI. I think you take whatever you have already. But yeah, but the what thing are is you this, discussing? The everything around, which is currently there um, is based on UTP gigabit and 100 megabit stuff. Um, the, if you look um, at, at the limits and test scenarios, um, also how, how the EMI tests are performed on gigabit, is that it's they are directly coupled with a power injector into the MDI um, with limits that don't really reflect the shielding attenuation of the real system. So um, I know that, I mean, this is currently being worked on, it will get there. Um, um, but saying that there are like these tests and limits already available is, is technically correct. There are numbers available. The question is, is it, are they really reflecting reality, mm -hmm. or is it is it just carry over legacy from how it was done at one hundred megabit? And I, at the moment, it's a lot of legacy carryover. All right. 
Thanks. Further questions? Yes, there is one question. Yeah. Oh, this is Ali Reza Razavi from Marvel. Uh, a question uh, is about autonomous Tripoli. Do you think that this should be added to some document? Do you see deficiency in the way that Tripoli is defined right now, or uh, or is it okay and this is one is extra? I don't know if I get the question correct. So you're asking if, if we need to spec anything specifically. Yes, exactly. So, um, um, well, as a silicon man, I would say less specs the better. In reality, it's probably OEMs and users want to have um, consensus how this stuff works. Um, having a common subset um, functionality um, makes sense. I personally don't think we need a lot of specs because this thing isn't really doing a lot of black magic. Um, what this thing is doing is um, um, it's observing um, uh, idle times and then goes autonomously into LPI and the only thing which it does is essentially filling a FIFO. Um, the, the question is what specifically would a spec specify um, except that devices shall have this mode? And then I'm a bit, I, I don't know if, if, if something like a, a register set or so is really required. Um, uh, perhaps OEMs or tier one companies can comment. I, I personally don't really think it's necessary. TC16, we have this optional test case now, which is testing uh, in interoperability this uh, uh, autonomous energy efficient ethernet um, uh, if uh, uh, five devices offer this mode just to make sure that when somebody claims to have it, that it also really does something. Uh, I also have another question. Uh, I know that you said that the number you cannot say how much power saving is. Can you give us some sense that how they're going to look like? I mean, Well, if you yeah. go to um, one of the booth here has a small um, leaflet thingy. Uh, it's a company in Taiwan and they have a number on there. That's um, uh, the order of magnitude is correct. I mean, I'm, I'm, there is no correct incorrect. It's 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 it, I, um, it's it makes sense. Um, and then in probably different silicon vendors have different numbers. I would guess um, it's it's really. I mean, you can you can go into LPI and not shut off anything, and then it's like roughly still 100% consumption. Um, it's it's significant. You can do it so that it's signif significant. Really significant. It thank makes you. a huge difference. All right, thank you. So, if there are no further questions, then we can uh, break for lunch and we will be back at uh, 2 p.m. Thank you. Yep. Thank you.